This episode of the Productivity is Podcast is brought to you by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like runners, cyclists, strength trainers, vegans, and more. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash Vardy. And now let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Productivities Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and with me today is Anthony Mativier. He is the founder of the Magnetic Memory Method. It's a systematic 21st century approach to memorizing foreign language vocabulary, dreams, names, music, poetry, and a whole bunch more in ways that are easy, elegant, effective, and fun. And if you've been listening to my show for a while and you've been following my work, you know that I don't like to use memory all that much. Uh, I like to use my mind to kind of create things and I rely on capturing uh, my thoughts and my ideas as a way to kind of free up my mind. But I wanted to have uh, Anthony on the show to kind of dive into this element of it because I think there are a lot of people that that not only – um, work well with working memory and they want to improve their memory. But there are some people that just want to get better at that. I know that Cal Newport's talked about in Deep Work and there's several other uh, indications. I can't remember the name of the book inside of Deep Work. Maybe somebody can drop me a line and let me know. But uh, it's about, you know, learning card tricks and stuff and memorizing. I think there's some real benefits to it. And uh, today he's going to share some tricks and some tips and some tactics. So it's not just, uh, you know, magic. Uh, there are some real things that you can do, and uh, I can't wait to get into it. So let's just get into it. Here's my conversation with Dr. Anthony Mativier here on the Productivityist Podcast. I'd like to welcome Dr. Anthony Mativier to the Productivityist Podcast. Thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me here, Mike. I really appreciate it. So I want to talk to you today about something that you are quite known for, and that's memory and, and memorization. And one of the things that I find when I'm working with people, or even just talking to people about productivity and time management in general, is this idea that they can remember every, like they, they, they rely on their memory. You know, they, they have these ideas or they have these tasks and they don't write them down. And, and, and they, and they, they basically are at the point now where when they, when they go to commit those things that they've tried to memorize to action, they struggle. Um, and, and my, my adage has always been, you know, capture relentlessly, like capture everything, regret nothing. I'd like to dive into how maybe people can optimize their memory and make their memory, as you call it, more magnetic. So that way they can, they can rely a little bit more on their brain because that's their natural tendency, right? Mm. Well, yeah, it is a natural tendency to a degree. The mind naturally filters out all kinds of information and we need that filtering to survive to not filter leads to certain conditions uh, like um, autism for example so we do need to actually not pay attention to certain amounts of information in our environment the whole idea of memorizing to-do lists to be more productive is actually kind of a controversial one in the memory world so the great Nemesis and magician and mentalist Darren Brown talks about how he was personally more likely to get the things done that he wanted to do if he memorized his to-do list. But it also, for many people, seems to increase the Saigarnik effect as opposed to having well-structured, written-down to-do lists and having memory ex externalized, so to speak, and managed externally rather than creating all kinds of pressure on the brain. So I think that the core foundation of using memory techniques has to do with really being strategic about what it is that's going to have a high margin impact on what you memorize as so opposed when you're, to just memorizing anything and everything. Right. So when you're working with somebody or when you're, when you're talking about this, like what are kind of the, the key components that people can work on to improve their memory and, and use it for you know, general self-improvement and productivity? I think the number one thing you can be doing is learning memory techniques for things like vocabulary, either for your own language or for another language, ideally for another language, because of the health benefits and the cultural benefits, which uh, enrich your life in so many ways. Also for numbers and for names and facts uh, and details about other people. Those are the real core elements. And then there's verbatim memorization, such as poetry and quotes and jokes 
quotes and all that kind of stuff and even wanting to memorize what people say word for word that can be very very useful and then there's just general things that fall under maybe what could be called stunts or party tricks uh, that that are just fun to be able to 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 show off and have quick mental exercise as well that is just personally edifying and then strengthens your general sense of memory as a muscle so just as you can go to the gym and make all different parts of your body more fit same thing with your mind just by learning these techniques so what got you so fascinated with the idea of studying memory and memorization? Because it's, it, I mean, people ask me like, why are you so into time management and productivity? And there's just a passion behind it. I can't quite necessarily put a finger on it, but what really got you into this field? Well, in this case, I can put a finger on it because it was total, absolute crushing Toronto winter depression and desperation where uh, I was facing my doctoral exams and proficiency exams and it was just a very very difficult time i couldn't concentrate i couldn't focus and i knew i had to do something or else stand in front of my first committee for the first field exam and completely fail or go and get a, a day job or something anything outside of university or i don't I don't know, I don't know, darker conclusions. And all of those things were options that went through my mind. And so I just started to avoid the world and was learning how to do magic tricks. And I came across the idea of memorizing a deck of cards as a, as a real, real magic, uh, not a trick. And I thought this was impossible. I can't even read a sentence from a book. And I gave it a try anyway, because it just was avoiding reality. And it works so well that I instantly saw that if I could memorize a deck of cards, I could just put any information on any set of 52 cards, index cards. And then I became deeply fascinated with how that works. I passed all my exams and I was more than a, a, a devotee to the study of memory, but really a junkie because it saved my life so incredibly that I thought I have to do something, anything to make sure other people who are in a similar situation or even less dire situations have access to this because this is real magic and anybody can do it. So when it comes to, to memory, I mean, one of the things I, I do is, is I, I, I guess I'm kind of on the, on the hybrid approach with this where I try to memorize less. So, but I try to memorize the really important things and everything else kind of sits in a framework. So for example, uh, I will memorize what each day's theme is supposed to be consistently. So I know, like, for example, we're recording this on a Wednesday. Every Wednesday for me is audio video day. So that's the only thing I really need to memorize because everything else is outlined, like my to-do list is outlined, and it's it's tethered to that to that idea that the theme of the day is, is audio video day. How do you t treat it? Because you, earlier you mentioned, you know, some, there, you know, the idea of memorizing your entire to-do list versus memorizing certain components. How do you, how do you approach that? Well, when it comes to actual time, I have a mnemonic calendar. So Mondays are associated with the moon. Uh, Tuesdays are with Thor. Um, Wednesdays are with the weather vane and so on and it's, it's just a, a, an image for every day uh, sunday is a is a sunday actual ice cream that i remember having with my grandmother then there's something called the major method which allows you to turn numbers into words so if something is at 8 p.m i use the 24 hour clock that uh, involves a nose because uh, of how the major method lets you turn numbers into words and so that's a way of just quickly encoding in one's mind little details about when you have to be certain places and on what day. So a nose dipping into a ice cream sundae that I had with my grandma many, many years ago is now going to remind me of, and I'll use the person that I'm meeting or whatever that event will be, and, and I'm, I'll just remember that. Uh, because it's a nose with that image involved dipping into ice cream and there's a reaction to it that, oh, that's cold or whatever it is that I come up with for that image or whatever Thor might be doing or whatever the weather vane might be doing. And that encodes it deeper into memory 
than writing it down alone. Although I do advocate actually writing it down just in case, because you know, you, you, you never know. And it's worth having both things going on, but that's a simple way to have a memory tool where you can ingrain into your mind, whatever you have on your plate and the exact time down to the minute, if that is necessary, by having an image for every day of the week and then a way of turning numbers into words. So those are one of the core techniques that you can, you can learn and use for managing your time. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. We're going to take a break from the show now so that we can talk about our sponsor, Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower rates on life insurance for health conscious people like runners, cyclists, strength trainers, vegans, and more. And this is really, really important. If you don't already have life insurance, you haven't been thinking about it. It's something you should be thinking about. You know, when my wife and I got married and we started having kids, we, we thought this is something that we want to make sure we have because, you know, my parents never had life insurance and, you know, as they're getting older, it's, it's something that they, they are starting to think about. Now you have the opportunity to start taking care of business on that front now. And Health IQ has a great way for you to do that, especially since they have this unique mortality model for the health conscious. So they offer lower rates for health conscious people when they qualify. So it's kind of like car insurance companies will will give good drivers better rates, right? Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health conscious lifestyle. 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% on their life insurance. And Health IQ can save the customers up to 33% because physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive. And so being health conscious doesn't just help you with your productivity. You know, whether you're eating better, getting active, all that stuff can help you be more personally productive. But in the case of Health IQ, if you qualify, it can help you save on life insurance as well. So to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash Vardy or mention the promo code Vardy when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Again, to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash Vardy. And now let's get back to the show. Now, you, you've got the podcast, the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. And by the way, I, I love the fact that you, there's still some thematic elements to that too, right? Like imagery and such. I think that's great um, because I, that, I definitely am a visual, like an avatar. I like to tether things to those avatars, to those triggers. But what is the what is the Magnetic Memory Method? Because, I mean, you've got your own approach. Like where, uh, I mean, I know when I talk about time crafting that people say, what is it? And it's, it's essentially having spent years studying time management and productivity, I've, I've, I've developed my own methodology out of it. Would, would that be the same with you? You've taken elements of, of, of your years of study and kind of created your own methodology around, around memory. Yes. And the reason for the word magnetic and the reason for the word method is very particular because a lot of people, they want to memorize it all. And the reality is, is you, you don't need it all. What you need is just like a magnet on a fridge. You need that pivotal piece that will stick whatever it is that you want to hold into place onto place in a place that you remember where it is. So it very much is a magnet holding something in place. That's what a mnemonic image is like a nose uh, dipping into a sundae. It, it's a placeholder. And it's, it's important that it's the 
place where I had ice cream with my grandmother because that serves as a kind of memory palace, which taps into spatial memory and also episodic memory, procedural memory, and all these different levels of memory are now working all at once. And the reason why I call it a method is because a lot of people out there are selling systems. They're mm -hmm. saying, you know, I have this memory system, and if you just learn my system, you will be able to do all these things. This is absolute, utter, 100% nonsense. There is no memory system except for the one that you create for yourself. So I offer people the methods of how the normal human brain works, and then I show you how you can create your own systems. And there's a kind of Bruce Lee level flexibility to this in which, you know, you've got to understand a certain amount of flexibility in your systems so that when the wind blows, you're like grass and you bend over as opposed to crumbling apart like a wall, which is what a lot of people experience when they get into memory techniques. They get frustrated because it's not quote unquote working like a system, but it can't really ever be a hundred percent system because it's your mind. It's your creativity. It's your, it's your chemical brain that is stacked against you in so many ways. And if you can just be calm and relaxed and as Bruce Lee would say, no ego, no enemy, and understand that this is methodology guiding your practice, then you're already way ahead of the game. And so I chose those words very, very specifically to reflect that kind of maybe martial arts level of approach to this as a lifestyle and a practice and, and an art and a craft, as opposed to a way, the way a lot of other people present it as some sort of magic bullet system because it's much deeper and more profound than that. Let's talk about choice of word. Like it's very, you're very deliberate about this, right? And I think that there's, there's, there's got to be an underlying reason other than what you've talked about. Like, I mean, when it comes to memory, the, what is, how important is it to be very intentional and deliberate about this stuff? Because I think that there's a lot to that. Oh, it's, it's, the, it's the game changer. And I often ask people to identify why it is that they want to remember something. Because the more that you are able to tap into, and I know it sounds a bit cliche and we hear it all the time, what's your why? But it's, it is quite fundamental because these techniques have laser focus. And if you organize the information that you want to memorize, then you're able to tap into different kinds of memory techniques that will serve that relative to the organization of the information. So do you want to memorize a list and have it strictly in order? Or do you want to be able to memorize things out of order? And the more that you put a little bit of pre-thought into this, the more you get actively engaged in the process and the better your outcome and your result is. So intention is, is very, very important. And it's why one of my biggest passions and successes is helping language learners with vocabulary because language is so chaotic. It's so large and there there's so many portals of en entry. And yet there are strategies that if you just get intentional about them and not go willy-nilly into any language and follow something like a, a, a methodology of where you're going to start, how many words you're going to do per day, how, how you're going to get those words into phrases – and how you're going to use other layers of processing, like speaking, writing, reading, and listening, so that those things serve memory, and then your memory serves those activities, then you can move much faster than a child, because people have this mythology that children learn languages naturally and quickly, which they don't. But you can tap into the childlike curiosity, lack of self-judgment, and all the wonderful things that they do have, and learn way faster than any child ever will, and be you know, hopping along in a language within three months or less. So it has a lot to do with intention, but you do need to take a moment or, or two to figure out what your intention is and really be intentional about it. Earlier on, you talked about the idea of, of you know, we have so much information coming at us and, and the filters that we need because people do try to remember everything, right? They try to remember all the things and then what happens is they don't do anything with great effect. How do you help, how do you, how do you treat, teach people to use their memory to deal with information overload? Or is it a matter of dealing with information overload first and then tapping into memory? How does that work? Well, I, 
like people to think about their learning hierarchy as one of the first ways to get a handle on information overload because there are not only learning hierarchies, but there are sensory modes. So a lot of people, they, they know intuitively or unconsciously or subconsciously that they prefer to learn from audio, for example, but they'll still go and search for books first as their first line of attack. But if you spend some time and think about what your preferences are and what you're most likely to learn from, then you can create a hierarchy. And so, for example, I wanted to learn WordPress better recently. And so I thought, I'm just going to, I love audio. I consume it like crazy. I learned from it very, very well. So I'm going to go and see if there are WordPress podcasts. I thought there can't possibly be, but it turns out that there's a bunch of them. So I just zoomed through that and learned a lot more quickly because of that preference. My next line of attack would be um, books. And very low on my learning hierarchy is video. I I really just am not a big uh, fan of sitting through videos. I'd rather just speed through what works. So when people can understand what their learning hierarchy is and what they're most likely to learn from, they can cut through a lot of information. It doesn't mean that you don't learn from the things that you're not, uh, are not part of your preference, but you just go to the most high margin medium first. And then in terms of your sensory preferences, we all have a combination of at least six modes. So there's visual, there's auditory, there's kinesthetic, there's gustatory, there's olfactory, which is taste and smell that don't necessarily play that much into into this, but it, they are useful to think about. And then there's just the sense of conceptual um, mode, sensory mode. And if you know where you fit most strongly in that profile and put some thought into it, knowing that it's not necessarily good going to be the same for every single topic, but get a sense of yourself. I'm very audio conceptual, for example, and where other, as other people might be visual conceptual. When you know that, then you can stretch the limits of yourself. You can be laser targeted. You can explore. You can, you know, be focused and intentional. And it's just a much stronger set of tools when you know these things about yourself and then explore them on that basis. Okay, so before we wrap up, there's I want to send somebody off here that's listening to this episode. They're they're investing in the idea that they want to have a better memory. What's the one thing that they could do to start things off? Because in the bonus episode for members, I want to dive a little bit deeper to three more things that they can do, maybe a little bit more specific or more tactical. But if someone wants to start to, you know, tap into, you know, a better, a more magnetic memory, where, what should they do? What, what's the first step they can take? The first step I strongly believe is to learn a technique called the memory palace. That's a term that some people don't like. Some people call it a mind palace. Ultimately, it, it's called location-based mnemonics, I guess. Uh, it's using some sort of building to create a journey, a mental path that you can walk along and you strategically create stops or you just identify stops like the four corners of a room, the room that you may be in right now while you're listening to this. And then you learn to create images that you place on those areas. I call them magnetic stations. And then by creating these images, you're encoding something that you want to remember, something that you want to learn. And because you've used your spatial memory as the basis upon creating this image, you've now increased your chances of being able to recall it. Because for most people, our strongest basis of memory is spatial. And it's the resource that we all have for free, because there are very few people who can't get some kind of mental image or mental concept of of space in their mind. Spatial memory is so powerful. We just seem to memorize locations on autopilot with very little exposure to them. And so that is the technique that I would say is the most useful for the most people to learn immediately. And the beauty of the memory palace is that every other memory technique I know of can be used inside of this spatial structure. Whereas not every other memory technique can be, you know, can invite a memory palace technique inside of it. So it's the most biggest toolbox. And it's also the most 
reproducible toolbox. Because if you can use the room you're in now, you can use any room you've ever been in in your past, and you can use every room that you'll ever be in in your future. So it's an inexhaustible resource because no one in, a, in any lifetime is ever going to run out of space. And uh, so that is the go-to technique for sure. I would highly recommend to anyone even just to experience it once in their lives. Anthony, this has been a fantastic uh, conversation diving into memory where, you know, I mean, I think that there's so much more we can get into. We're going to get into a little bit more in the bonus episode for members only. But for those of you, for, for those who want to learn more about your work, uh, where can they go now to kind of dive into things a little bit deeper? I'd, I'd suggest just visiting my core website, magneticmemorymethod.com and listen to an episode or two of the podcast. Podcast. I have written versions of almost every podcast. So if you prefer to read, then that's an option as well. And there's video options. And if you would like a free course, it's quite clear on the page how to uh, avail yourself of that. And I would be honored to have your attention in any of those ways. Thanks again so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. That wraps up this week's episode of the show. Thanks to Dr. Anthony Mativier for joining me today on the show. You can find all of the links that we discussed, uh, all the relevant ones, in our show notes. And, of course, we also show the the, the, the the podcast episodes on the blog as well. So if you go to productivities.com and look up the show episode, so it'll be podcast and then the episode number, which will be listed, of course, uh, in your uh, podcast catcher. Uh, so, it, you know, that that will help you as well. So if you want to get right on the blog and look at it, you can do that as well. But, uh, you know, I had a great time chatting it. And, you know, I mean, it's funny. Uh, memory is something that I used to pride myself on. The idea that, you know, when I was doing sketch and improv, particularly sketch, is that I, I could memorize things. I used to memorize speeches. And I'd like to get back to that. And what, what I want to be able to do, and one of the reasons that I had uh, Anthony on the show, was to say, okay, look, you know, I capture a lot, so that way I can free my my mind up, but I want to be able to remember and memorize certain things. So I'm going to take some of these these tools and approaches that he presented today and that method and uh, apply it to my own work and apply it to my own life. And I hope you can too. And I hope you will too. And I hope you will be back for the next episode of the Productivity Podcast and joining me and my producer, John Polstra, who puts this show together and Jim Woods, who puts the show notes together and my assistant, Claire, who helps put, you know, all the other things together to make the show what it is each and every week. That's it for now. Until next time, I am Mike Vardy, the host of the Productivity Podcast, reminding you to stop guessing and start going. <laughs>